Now on the National Weather Desk, Canadian wildfires. How the fires continue to impact air quality in the United States. People's homes are literally burning down. Their lives are being turned upside down. Green dangers. How grass and brush now growing in Utah could fuel this season's wildfires. I'm concerned here in middle of July that things will start browning up, drying up. Coral reefs. How the decline of sea urchin could have a devastating effect on one region's reefs. This reef is so ecologically important to the globe. Dune erosion. Rebuilding the sand dunes damaged by Hurricane Ian. Dunes are the first natural defense against coastal flooding. And summer safety. How to make sure all members of your family are safe in the summer heat. And if it's too hot for you, it's too hot for them. From our nation's capital, this is the National Weather Desk. Good morning and welcome to the National Weather Desk. I'm meteorologist Matt Ritter. Wildfires in Nova Scotia, Canada are triggering air quality alerts in several U.S. states. Smoke and haze will linger in parts of the Midwest and Northeast this week. We'll take a closer look at the impact on air quality in just a moment, but we begin with Jen Sullivan and the latest on the wildfires themselves. Historic wildfires raging through parts of Canada. More than 26,000 people have been forced to evacuate their homes. People's homes are literally burning down. Their lives are being turned upside down. So far this year, 8 million acres have burned. The flames causing giant plumes of smoke to tower over the region. This is incredibly difficult and heartbreaking. But the effects of the fires aren't just being felt in Canada. The smoke triggering air quality warnings in the U.S., impacting millions of Americans from the Midwest to the Northeast. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Canada, at least 200 structures have been damaged. Firefighters are doing their best to contain it. We're going to get through this together. I'm Jen Sullivan reporting. The air could look like this over the next few days, full of haze due to wildfires that is blowing some smoke in the atmosphere, mainly over the eastern half of the U.S. Notice here on the map, the darker that red color, the higher the concentration of the smoke protocols in the atmosphere. And as we play this throughout the day on Wednesday, it begins to drift southward. This is mainly going to impact portions of the Midwest, the Mid-Atlantic, and the Northeast. So the National Weather Service has put in air quality alerts into effect for the smoke particles. All of New York State is under an air quality alert, including other portions of the Northeast, Philadelphia and Delaware, portions of Maryland under an air quality alert, and also all of Wisconsin and Southern Minnesota also under this air quality alert. The worst it really looks to be getting in terms of our air quality index looks to be in the unhealthy for some sensitive groups. This includes the very young, the elderly, or anyone who has respiratory issues. If you fall into this category and live near one of these air quality alerts, what you're going to want to do is keep the doors and windows closed and limit your outdoor activities as much as possible until that smoke clears. Well, Utah is green these days, very green, and it's all thanks to this past winter's historic snowfall. But with that green comes concern. Once it dries out, will it help fuel their wildfire season? Lincoln Graves has more on how the state is preparing. John Hansen has noticed something on his routine walks in North Salt Lake's Eagle Ridge neighborhood. You know, it seems like it is. It just seems like everything's bigger. He's referring to vegetation. Trees, bushes, shrubs, grass, all bigger and very green thanks to our historic winter. I'm concerned here in middle of July that things will start browning up, drying up. State officials are worried too. They gathered in John's neighborhood to plead with Utahns. Adopt fire sense practices now in case what's green now burns up later. I've never seen it so green, which is great until it's not, right? Because that means there's just so much more to burn than we usually have. Officials want Utahns to be careful. As for the state, I asked the governor if they're prepared with enough funding, considering emergency money had to be approved for flooding emergencies. When we talk about fire season, are you confident we're going to have en enough when it comes, no matter what fire season brings? Yeah, well, I, I certainly hope so. And the legislature's done a good job of this. We've worked very proactively to put money aside for wildfire in our wildfire account. Cox says more money can be sought if it's needed. As for firefighting strategy before things burn, state fire leaders say they're already being proactive. Firefighters, state officials, they're just sitting in a room somewhere waiting for a fire to start and then they pounce type of thing. Is that how it is? No, no. A lot of our fire engines, they're out doing project work um, to help do a fuels mitigation. The state does. They go out and do fuels mitigation for people. A lot of your federal resources, the same thing. They're out and about. They're definitely not just sitting, sitting there waiting for the call. 
And a programming reminder, tomorrow on the National Weather Desk, we're taking a closer look at the upcoming wildfire season. Our special looks at how the wet winter could make this year's fire season even worse than usual. And we'll also show you how firefighters are preparing. Watch In the Line of Fire tomorrow right here on the National Weather Desk. Well, people in Columbus, Ohio are picking up the pieces after a fierce storm struck over the weekend. Stephanie Dupre says folks who experienced the fury said it was like being in a movie. High, high winds immediately, almost like the Wizard of Oz when you see the cows flying through the air. Mike Mundy and all of his neighbors around Oxford Road are still cleaning up after Saturday's storm. Upper Arlington got slammed with wind and rain. It only lasted for a short time, but wreaked the most havoc. Mundy says his neighbors watched as the storm destroyed his property. It took out a big chunk of our fence here along the, uh, the power lines. Lightning actually struck this tree up, up towards the top of the tree. Some folks had more damage than others. Becky Hinga and her husband, Bill, live across the street from Mundy. They said their house barely had a scratch. Just so focused on certain yards, certain houses. I, we've just finished a three mile walk and just going, oh my goodness, how odd. With a storm like this, Typically, you're unprepared. Mundy says a lot of his neighbors aren't sure what's next. They tell you about cleanup. Like, are you going to have to be so, responsible for this? Yeah, I think so. Like, they didn't really give us any clear indication of, you know, I think, from, from what I can tell, we're responsible for taking care of this. We're just going to have to, like, file an insurance claim, I guess. Well, Tropical Storm Arlene came and went pretty quickly last week in the Gulf of Mexico, but it's not the first storm to have that name. While any storm named Arlene will naturally be the first of the season, Mobile, Alabama meteorologist Alan Seals says each had unique characteristics. Now into hurricane season, we carefully watch the tropics each day to see what may be there. And if you haven't been keeping up, there was something there this past weekend. It was Tropical Storm Arlene, the first named storm of the Atlantic hurricane season. It formed in the eastern Gulf of Mexico and took an unusual southward track. It only lasted for about a day and a half before weakening and fading away near Cuba. But when you think about Arlene, some other Arlenes may come to mind. You may know that the names are repeated every six years unless a tropical storm or hurricane becomes very deadly or very costly. So going back to the 1980s, these are all the different tracks of the Arlenes. Now keep in mind, each one has the same name, but each one also had a far different life. In fact, most of the Arlenes being the A storm where were early in the season. In fact, the earliest Arlene occurred April 19th. It started as a tropical depression, then became a tropical storm. Contrast that, though, with the Arlene that formed in 1987 in late August. The first named storm formed in August that year, and out of all the Arlenes, it was the only one that became a hurricane. Now, the other one that's a little more substantial is Arlene that formed in 2005. That's because it struck the Florida-Alabama line near Perdido Key nearly as a hurricane only nine months after Hurricane Ivan and only about two and a half months before Hurricane Katrina. That was a very busy period. Most of these storms otherwise did not make landfall. Most of them were very brief, very weak, but it simply tells you that just because a storm has the same name as another storm, it doesn't mean it's going to behave the same way. I'm meteorologist Alan Seals. In the past two weeks, six earthquakes were recorded in western North Carolina. The two most recent happened on Sunday with magnitudes of 3.2 and 2.2. There was no reported damage. And while there isn't a major fault line in the area, earthquakes are not that uncommon there. Still, a local mayor is looking for answers. I mean, I'm not alarmed. I'm, I'm losing sleep over a lot of issues for the right. town of Canton right now. Earthquakes is not one of them. But however, uh, this is not just a joking matter anymore. We're going to try to figure out exactly what to expect uh, and, and go from there. The strongest earthquake to hit the region was a 5.2 back in 1916. And coming up on the National Weather Desk, we'll head to Israel, where black sea urchins are disappearing in mass and it could spell disaster for local reefs. Plus, tips to keep your pets safe during the hot summer months.
Hi everyone, I'm meteorologist Charlie Lopresti with Look the Northeast. We still have this big sprawling area of low pressure that's plaguing the Northeast with some clouds and showers from time to time. We also have an air quality alert for a good chunk of the Northeast from those wildfires in Quebec. Some of that smoke is working its way all the way down through New Jersey, New York, and southern New England. This is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Notice some pop-up showers. Temp looks seasonably cool. That's going to be the rule on Wednesday as well. Look for a lot of clouds, seasonably cool temperatures, and a few showers. I'm meteorologist Jonathan Myers and here's a look at the mid-Atlantic region as we work our way through the morning hours on Tuesday and all the way into the afternoon. It looks like sunshine fading to some clouds by about 2.33 o'clock, especially over portions of Maryland and perhaps uh, Delaware, New Jersey, getting a couple of spot showers, maybe even a rumble that goes through late day and then pulls away as a weak cold front swings through. Ahead of that, though, going to be nice and warm. 87 Baltimore, 86 Richmond. That's the scene here. I'm meteorologist Vitas Reed. A hot one out there for some areas. Looking at 91 in Nashville, 87 in Atlanta, making 91 degrees. Charleston at 84, 87 in Raleigh, 83 Pensacola, Tampa, about 90 degrees. Mobile coming in at 85. Looks like high pressure will be over parts of the southeast, central over centered over Georgia, giving us plenty of clear skies all across parts of the region. Now, late afternoon, there could be a few pop-up showers, and across parts of Florida, a few pop-ups as well, but more sun than rain. Presented by the National Weather Desk. Here's a recent image of a landspout tornado near Aurora, Nebraska. While they have damage capability, they're weaker and the way they form is different from other tornadoes. Rotating thunderstorms can spawn supercell tornadoes, but landspouts form during a storm's developing stage. Spinning originates near the ground, and the updraft pulls air from the surface into the storm. Listen to Off the Radar, new episodes every Tuesday. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. Well, a fast-moving disease is slowly cutting down on the population of black sea urchins in Israel's Gulf of Eilat. According to researchers, this could have devastating effects on coral reefs in the Red Sea. The ecosystem relies on urchins keeping algae at bay and preserving oxygen in the process. Hadas Gold has a first-hand look at this delicate balance. The pristine waters of the Gulf of Aqaba in the Red Sea, reefs teeming with colorful fish. But something is missing and it's threatening this entire ecosystem. In a very short time, we experience a massive catastrophe of uh, talking about losing a species, which is to live there forever. In January, black sea urchins here started dying en masse. Within days, entire populations of thousands were getting sick and literally disappearing. We've never seen any fluctuations on that magnitude, and now to say that Sea urchins were completely gone, that whatever is killing them is still defined as a waterborne pathogen. We know that it is transmitted through the water, that you don't need direct contact, that it takes uh, 48 hours for an individual to go from a live, healthy individual to basically bare skeleton. Vital to keep the delicate balance of life here, these urchins consume the algae that can choke reefs already stressed by human activity and the effects of climate change. This coral reef is unique in the world because of its ability to withstand high temperatures, making it more resistant to the effects of climate change. And that's why this reef is so ecologically important to the globe. Spin it down. Researchers are using DNA technology to make a difference. So basically just establishing a new monitoring method a high throughput and non-evasive one. It's allowing us to follow processes in the water of different uh, species. So in a way you're trying to uh, predict the future. 
with what More or less, yeah, without going through the water, yeah. <laughs> But the time to save these black sea urchins is running out, Dr. Bronstein says. If we don't take extra care about what we pump into this environment, we may find ourselves in a um, huge problem, in a huge situation. In South Carolina, dunes are one of the first lines of defense against storms. And several dunes near Myrtle Beach were damaged last year by Hurricane Ian. Now that we're in the 2023 hurricane season, local officials are working hard to restore those dunes. Michael Owen has a look at what's being done in the Grand Strand. Well, you know, dunes are the first natural defense against coastal flooding um, to protect businesses and homes. Dr. Ellis says that without the dunes, the South Carolina coast would flood constantly. The impacts would be detrimental to our local economy because two thirds of tourism dollars come from the coast. Dr. Ellis is working with a team to ensure that doesn't happen. She tests dunes in South Carolina using laser scanners, measuring vegetation to create grid systems, and tracking how the dunes are changing. She's looking for ways to restore the dunes and what damages them. Looking at um, high tide flooding and storms and which is more damaging to our coastal systems. She's also looking for ways to make the dunes more resilient. Things like adding sand fences to keep people off and vegetation safe. Because she says protecting the dunes is more than just adding sand. Resilience is bigger, but also, you know, vegetated. It's not just bigger, but it's vegetated. If you have a bigger dune that has nothing on it, that's not as effective. She also has a friendly suggestion for next time you're enjoying the beautiful beaches in South Carolina. Instead of taking a picture of the ocean, that they can also take a picture of them looking at the dunes and they can save that memory as well. Because um, interestingly enough, the hazards to the beach are from the beauty that they tend to take a picture of in the water, but the protection comes from the dune. And the beach is a great place to cool off from the summer heat. And that's important because heat is the number one cause of weather-related deaths. Mike McCarthy is here with tips on staying safe during the dog days of summer. Let's talk about safety, starting with hydration. This time of year, you always hear, stay hydrated, drink enough water. Well, what does that really look like? This is a 20 ounce bottle of water. And if you can drink this much water over the course of an hour, you're going to be close to the CDC's recommendation for how much water you should have. But a liter of water, this bigger bottle is even better and you can see just how much more water that would be over the course of an hour. That's water. Let's talk sunscreen now. Dermatologists say your best bet is to use at least an SPF 30. Why? It blocks most of the sun's UVB rays, which are a major cause of your sunburn when you get one. But listen to this, no matter the SPF number, you still need to apply over the same amount of time. A higher SPF does not mean it lasts longer. Follow the directions on a sunscreen's bottle, but a good rule is applying every two hours. And of course, the summer heat can be hazardous to your pets as well. Aaron Bowling is in Michigan with that part of the story. When animal control officer Sean Lutz hits the road in the summer, he pays close attention to pets in cars. Yeah, during the summer months, typically June, July and August, uh, it's, it's pretty average that we'll run between 18 and 20 uh, dogs in a vehicle a week. He says animals left outside without shelter or water are a big problem. We try to look around, see if we can see dogs that may, may need a little help. And that animals left inside cars are an even bigger problem. I always try to get a couple different spots on the vehicle. There on the dashboard, it's 127. Now it's 128. Okay, that is a very dangerous level temperature for a dog to be left in the vehicle or a cat or a young child or anything. Before you take your dog on any sort of pavement, it's important to check it with your hand first. And if it's too hot for you, it's too hot for them. If you can't leave your hand on the pavement for more than a minute, your dog probably doesn't want to walk on that. Dr. Misty Sumner is Jackson's animal control veterinarian and says for animals, heat stroke sets in way faster than you might think. She says darker colored animals are at a higher risk, but that all owners need to keep a close eye on their pets in the summer. The best thing you can do for your pet is leave them at home in their cool area. Even though we love to take them with us, they're our buddies, they're not gonna wanna be in that car and it can happen so quickly 
you don't really want to take that chance in the summer. A reminder to check out our podcast, Off the Radar. A new episode is out today. It's all about the sounds that the Northern Lights make. If you didn't know that the Northern Lights make sounds, then this episode is for you. You can find Off the Radar wherever you get your podcasts. As we go to break, views from high above Sparks Marina Park, just outside Reno, Nevada. Good Tuesday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Andrew Buck Michael taking a look at your weather story across the Midwest. We got 90s across the plains and some 70s across the Great Lakes, so a little bit cooler there, but all in all, not much rain today. We could use more of it, and that rain will slowly work its way to the south heading into your Wednesday with cooler air filtering in across the Great Lakes and the Ohio Valley, but still 90s across the plains. And by the time we get to Thursday, still 90s out there and the Dakotas, but relatively comfortable across a lot of the Midwest. Good Tuesday morning to our meteorologist Chris Suchan. Our forecast today across the region and uh, starting off with pretty quiet weather, 60s and 70s. Morning temperatures, there is a little bit of a severe risk in southwest Texas late day out there towards El Paso. Otherwise, we'll just see a couple of hit or miss showers and thunderstorms, highs in the 80s. That's really not that bad for early June. And then Wednesday, another day in the 80s to near 90, a couple of heavier thunderstorms possible late day in West Texas on Wednesday. Well, hi there, everybody, and a happy Tuesday to you. I'm meteorologist Shannon O'Donnell. Out west, pretty quiet, certainly getting warmer. We've got fog keeping the Bay Area, L.A., and San Diego, the June gloom, all in the 60s versus 82 as we heated up today in the Emerald City and 92 down the road in Portland. And even 100 out of Phoenix in terms of some stormy weather, still this area of low pressure as the current weather maker pushing over the Sierra Nevada, popping some thunderstorms there into the four corners today. And that's the scene from here. the National Weather Desk. A rare lobster caught in Casco Bay, Maine has scholars, both students and teachers, pretty excited. The lobster is bright orange and has only one claw. It's heading to the University of New England to be studied more in depth. One of the top things researchers will look at has to do with the environment and whether it has an impact on the lobster's color. One of the things that we're going to be able to see here is, is the reason why, is her color due to genetics or is it due to the environment? Because as she grows that back, is it going to be the gorgeous orange or is it going to be a slightly different color? Tilburg says he is looking forward to studying the lobster and he hopes to get more people interested in them. The chances of finding an orange lobster are said to be 1 in 30 million which is much harder than finding a blue lobster, which is one in two million. Well, we'd love to share your weather content on the air. You can find us on all your favorite social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Just search the National Weather Desk. We'll be right back.
Thank you for joining us. A reminder, tomorrow on the National Weather Desk, we're taking a closer look at the upcoming wildfire season. In the Line of Fire looks at how the wet winter could make this year's season even worse than usual. I'm meteorologist Matt Ritter. Make it a great Tuesday, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.